Okay, while they're trying to figure out microphone four, um, I'm going to just give you a little bit of background. Um, <laughs> at, at the federal level, there's stuff happening all the time, and so the best laid plans um, always fall apart. And so we were, uh, we were fully prepared for Anne to graciously turn on our invitation this year, and surprise, she didn't. Everything worked out this year. All the stars aligned uh, for Anne to attend, which is really awesome because if you've been following uh, DEF CON for a while, we've had speakers from CISA, um, speakers from NSA, speaker from other agencies, but we have never had um, a speaker in the White House, you know, Deputy National Security Advisor, Cyber. It's just the people are very busy. <laughs> um, so I'm really, I'm really excited you made it. Um, and so we've got some topics we're going to talk about, but I think really it's an opportunity for us to hear uh, Anne's perspective and then for Anne to kind of tell us her perspective from, from sitting in her position, where she sees things going, and, um, and then hopefully we'll have an interesting conversation and we can all learn a bit. So let's see, do they have the, are you set up now? Folks hear me now? We're actively working on it. We just tested it. Nope. They're working on it still. Okay. Yeah. Our lives is small. Yeah. This, so maybe I'll, um, since you can't speak, I have the advantage. Um, this is purely accidental. <laughs> um, I guess I'll, I'll start with maybe a, a second topic. I was gonna, we were going to bring up the, the different teams, but since it requires a little bit of me speaking, I'll do it now. One of the things I've been noticing for a number of years, is, and I've spoken about it, is this idea of sort of a, there's sort of a team rule of law, a sort of team authoritarian or team uh, autocrat, whatever you want to say. There's a group of undecided nations that are being influenced by rule of law nations. We're trying to get them on our side. Authoritarians are trying to bargain with these undecided countries, wherever they may be, Africa, Central America, trying to get them on their side, see the world through their lens. And what's happening is we're going through sort of a slow motion sorting process. Are you on our side or are you on their side? Right, this multipolar, um, and with tech, that's sort of accelerating. Are you picking our tech stack or their tech stack? Are you letting them into our app store or their app store, right? And you can sort of see this sorting at a tech level happening in Russia right now, with due to the Ukrainian war, not going so well right now for Russia. A lot of videos are on YouTube. Russia's now telling their tech industries, filter YouTube, slow it down, move everybody over to our YouTube, right? So. The Russian government is sorting the Russian citizens into picking the Russian tech stack. And I think this is becoming more explicit. And so that means we're, we're in a sorting war, kind of, and we should probably be engaged and we should think about it and not make it easy for our adversaries to sort our friends away. And, um, and that means that, you know, we don't have to agree with all of our rule of law friends, partners, and allies. It's sort of like you're on a team. That's why it's called a team. You don't always agree with your teammates. You don't always play the sport the same way, but you're all working sort of together. And uh, anyway, so one of my questions to Anne once we got going and her microphone was working, was gonna be about, do you, you know, how do you think about this? I'm sure you use different language. I'm sure at the national level they have different concepts, but as an outsider, it's sort of, it seems like something's going on internationally and in tech and we don't want it to happen to us. We want to have a, a seat, the wheel. So are you, are you, are they got you going yet? I'm folks, can you hear me? Nothing working. Here, I'll just give you my mic. Oh, I found the microphone. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, I'll be right over here. Hey, yeah. we're gonna do this, folks. First. Move the microphone, move the microphone up a little bit. Yeah. Whatever it's, this is a community that knows whatever it takes to get the job done. So first, it's wonderful to be here. 
of the year I come is this year. So that bottle is a good challenge. It, um, it's wonderful to be here. Jeff, you know, noted why I was here. I'm really here because we need this community. Whether we think about the CrowdStrike incident, which showed us the gaps in digital resilience, whether we look at the hacks we see from the Iranians and the Russians against water infrastructure, power infrastructure in the United States, or frankly, whether we look at on any given week, I get a call from our situation room with a ransomware attack, usually by folks based in Russia, that disrupts the hospital. When a hospital is disrupted, that's canceled medical services, that's ambulances turned away, it's impact on real people, particularly in communities where there's only one hospital. So those, the as we live really, really digital lives, the disruption in those lives touches people every single day. Kids at school, people who really need hospital medical services, and all around the world as well. So being here is a privilege to have a chance to talk to this community. <laughs> We're trying to make this cozy, oh well. Um, and talk to this community. So it's wonderful to be here. <laughs> so um, you, you mentioned CrowdStrike. Um, and so you're sitting at the job and you get messages saying, oh no, airports are down, and trans, all these things are happening because of the CrowdStrike um, problem. But you don't know it's the CrowdStrike problem yet. Thank you. Doesn't that look a lot like the preparatory or preparatory moves that China might make before going for Taiwan, right? Like you're disrupting air traffic, you can't have military transport authority going. It's like, that's in those unknown moments, what's going through your head? Like, how do you quickly realize, no, no, we're, it, it's, it's a mistake, it's not a, you know, preparatory move? Because it seems like, well, the tech industry has gotten us to a point now where a bad deployment can look a lot like the prelude to an invasion. It's like that's not a place you want to be in. And you know, it's really interesting because there's two parts to my job, which is really the reason the president, my job has been the first time that in the White House, they have somebody who works in the National Security Council. And the National Security Council typically focuses on, as it sounds, national security threats, who focuses on cyber and emerging tech. And really the reason was the question you just asked, because there's two parts to every problem. One is us and one is them. And us is how is this attack successful and how do we quickly assess the impact and accelerate recovery because we can't have disruption of the most important things in Americans' lives. The second part is them. Who is the actor? Is it a criminal? Is it a country or a set of criminals, a set of countries? And then our goal overall is how do we respond to deter the next attack? And that's really hard in cyberspace. First, first, because attribution is often hard. Second, because, okay, so if Russia-based ransomware attackers disrupted a hospital chain, right? Ascension Health, a number of months ago, multiple hospitals across multiple states, took them almost six weeks to recover from that ransomware attack. What's the deterrence? from an individual perspective, right? There isn't law enforcement cooperation today between the US and Russia. From an infrastructure perspective, we've done takedowns of infrastructure, often with partners around the world. They're temporary. There's so much vulnerable infrastructure that attackers can use in the second round. And what's driving it? It's often cryptocurrency and getting paid. In 2023 alone, there's $1.3 billion paid in ransoms. And we can talk at length about cryptocurrency and what we see it enabling from money laundering to sanctions evasions in the North Koreans context. But it's really hard when you start unpacking the problem and you say, how do you deter it? And this actually played out just this week, folks may have seen, at the UN, there's a global discussion on a new UN cybercrimes treaty. It would be the first one ever. And navigating both civil society and human rights groups who say, anything you do enables authoritarian governments to stop somebody traveling and say, hey, do you have the password to that system? On the other hand, you have countries like the United States, the UK, Australia, Singapore, countries around the world that want to partner and work together because these are problems that have no borders. So to your point, bringing that together, the us and the them, comes together in the case of each time an incident happens. So with CrowdStrike, you know, I happen to have been on the in, um, I happen to have been out of Washington, so my phone rings at 4 a.m., it's a situation room, they're like, hi, we need to notify you of an incident. 
my first call was the CEO. And as soon as he walked through what had happened, we knew it could only be either an insider or what. Uh, okay, so you woke up George. Insider? I think George was up. Well uh, already awake, yeah. He was already well awake. But that's really our first, qu but our first question always is in the middle of an incident, the us question. What's the impact and how do we recover as fast as possible? The second question is who did it and what do we do about it? Because what's most important is that we recover. Right, so having that quick ability to get to the source quickly allied your concerns that it was anything else, right? So that, that tight connection between the need for the tight connection between private industry and government, right? You need to have a really good Rolodex because when something goes wrong, you need to literally get there in minutes. And it raised, honestly, it raised questions for all of the software industry because there are many and all of us who've coded and deployed know when we see something like this happen, the first thing we say is, there but for the grace of God go I. <laughs> so I think in that case it raised real questions about testing, about rollback and what's possible, what's not, about testing across an ecosystem between different companies, the cooperation that enables that. So I think that's the kind of things we're now working on with companies to say, given our lives run on this digital infrastructure, we need to have confidence that when there are updates, they're staged, they're properly tested, and they can be rolled back if something goes wrong. It's super fascinating because far enough back in time, um, I think it was maybe not after Slammerworm, but um, Microsoft wanted to move a bunch of these uh, drivers out of the kernel not give access to developers, right, ring zero or maybe ring one. And uh, the pushback from the Europeans were, that was anti-competitive um, market forces argument. And, um, and from antivirus vendors, it was oh, also anti-competitive. You'll keep your stuff in the ring zero, it'll be faster, more performant. Our stuff will be at a disadvantage. Yeah, so Microsoft, you know, relented. And then decades later, it blows up in their face. And now the same governments are saying, why are you allowing them to do this in Ring Zero? Why, why can one vendor destroy, you know, the entire operating system and everybody else? And so it almost seems like the regulators now are starting to become more educated or more nuanced. Maybe they can understand the impacts of some of their market forces. Market force demands carry the day. You know, arguments around markets carry the day, but now, now there's arguments around security. And they have maybe more weight now. And so now you, you can make a better trade-off, right? So do you find yourself maybe the security argument being, having more weight in these discussions? It does. Or is this commerce just roll in there and say, you know, you know, commerce dictates everything? You know, on the positive side, more and more governments and people see that policy has to move, not at the speed of tech. It would be ideal if it moved at the speed of tech, but at least much, much faster. So things that we considered five years ago or 10 years ago are totally changed, right? right. I was walking around and I really encourage folks to visit the DARPA's AI Cyber Challenge booth. Now, when we launched the DARPA AI Cyber Challenge a year ago with DARPA, what was so exciting was to say, Let's be candid. Folks on offense are already a step ahead. Because on offense, you have to find vul one vulnerability to exploit. On defense, you constantly have to be managing a pretty broad space. And particularly when I think of us on the government side, when I think about DOD, we have weapons programs or weapons, think submarines, satellite systems for sure, that were launched 30 years ago. They're facing a modern adversary that they never yeah, considered, yeah. right? When they built the risk models, frankly, when they built and deployed the encryption. We're in a very different world just in terms of high performance computing advancements and encryption we may have launched 30 years ago in a satellite. So the core goal I think we have to consider on defense is tech is our helper. Tech is our partner because it's so much harder. So for example, what's so cool, and I don't know where it is now, but when I passed earlier, the AI Cyber Challenge, the teams had found three vulnerabilities in open source code that you would imagine has been fuzzed, has been checked, et cetera. And not only that, they built a patch for at least one of them when I passed using open mo like, it's using AI models. That's remarkable because if that can bring tech to the defensive fight, to the securing fight, potentially that could change that offense defense dynamic, which is really tough for all of us who want to build and deploy technology that's underpinning our lives, our militaries, our banks every single day. So, um, so that's kind of 
maybe a good tie-in. So you've got two parts to your title, right? Maybe two hats, emerging technology and security. So when you were speaking just then I was thinking, ah, emerging technology, AI. But you also have to wear your security hat, right? Are they ever in conflict? Do you? You know, it's interesting. I think, so I've had the privilege of both running offensive and defensive cyber operations. Wait, wait, try to get most close, yeah, to the mic. <laughs> Now I have to stand and be closer. Sorry about that. <laughs> we'll get this. Um, so I started to say, you heard Jeff's question, I've had the privilege of both running offensive and defensive operations. So we try very much from a defensive perspective to bring that offensive mindset to say, what's the easiest way and what's the most persistent way that an adversary might try to get into the system and how do we defend against that? And I think in the emerging tech area, when I think about where we spend a lot of our time. So next week, NIST will be announcing the first post-quantum cryptography formal standards that are going for FIP standardization. That's exciting, right? Cryptography is the root of almost everything of what we do in cybersecurity. And one of the main ways asymmetric cryptography is at risk if somebody can build a cryptographically relevant quantum computer. We think that's, you know, six to 10 years off, but it's a massive risk because that kind of key exchange underpins so much of security when we're shopping well, safety that, online. Right, and now they're talking about the store now, decrypt later. It's, right, so even if it's six to 10 years from now, it's not really six to 10 years on the most sensitive. On information you care about. Right. Um, so when those standards are, when NIST announced them next week, the cool part of our jobs is then saying, okay, who are the core companies who are already testing? Apple's testing, Google's testing, Amazon, and some of them have done deployments already of post-quantum cryptography. Let's get that out first. Let's get that deployed because frankly, as we know as cryptography, the algorithms are often the easiest part. It's the implementation where there's often errors that can be exploited. So that's where the emerging tech part of the job comes together. Similarly, when we think about AI, there's so much opportunity for AI to help us on the defensive side, and there's so much opportunity for AI to help on the offensive side. The first step of either one is finding vulnerabilities. Whether you then go to patch them or you go to exploit them, we want to be on the defensive side that the most sensitive systems, we have teams like everyone here helping us as the cyber challenge is doing to actually use generative AI to find and patch. And that's what's exciting and that's where there's opportunity. It's, it's a, yeah, the, the part that I find fascinating with AI and this potential promise is that you can spend an insane amount of money trying to train AI to like auto patch, auto secure software. And you think about it and you're like, really, who's going to spend that much money? And then you realize CrowdStrike outage, $10 billion in loss. For $10 billion, you could probably do a lot of training AI to auto rewrite insecure code, run it against GitHub, and lift the entire ocean of the planet's baseline security from just one outage equivalent in value. And so when you, when I start thinking about it that way, I realize that I would rather spend the money doing that than patching broken CrowdStrike, you know, systems. And so if, is there a role in government to say, okay, DARPA or whoever, uh, let's do more of that faster. Let's try to auto patch faster because it seems like the, the market is not going to spend 10 billion on its own, but maybe in partnership, maybe in there's a consortium, maybe if there's some government seed funding, there is a way where government can start and the industry can finish. I mean, do you think, am I off base? Is that even a role of government? I think that's absolutely the role of government. So I'll give an example, you know, really two that we'll talk about, and then I want to come back to the cost thing. Yeah. So one program that we launched a year ago, really building on and copying an idea that came from Singapore and Finland, is called the Cyber Trust Mark program. So when somebody's shopping for a baby monitor, or to be honest, my dread, which is a connected home security system, there's no way to know, is this product cyber safe? Has it been tested against any cybersecurity standard? Does the vendor patch it? What kind of vulnerability testing did this vendor do? And we know that companies say, look, we're willing to do the extra work, but we'd love to be able to differentiate ourselves. And on the consumer side, a mom who's shopping for a baby monitor, she's worried about folks hacking in and looking at or listening to her, listening to her kid. But how does she know if a product is safe? So 
We launched a program a year ago called the Cyber Trust Mark, which is a labeling program. Essentially, any products, think connected smart TVs, baby monitors, home security systems, Nest thermostats, that meets the government standard and gets tested for it, because just companies saying our product is good probably doesn't work for many consumers. They want to know, was it tested? Can have a label. It's called the Cyber Trust Mark. We launched it a year ago. It had to go through a whole bunch of legal processes. Half of this is always implementation. And as of Friday, it's live on the Federal Register. And you know, companies like Amazon said they'll on their websites, they'll note labeled products at the top. Best Buy said that they'll have their folks in stores train people. And companies from Samsung to Google to LG said they'll be submitting their products to be tested. So that's a great example of where we in government are not saying, well, we're mandating this. We're saying, you know what? There's an ecosystem of people who want to bring in more secure tech to their homes, their schools, their offices. Companies who say, look, we get it. We'd rather build a more secure product. We'd rather commit to patching it and not just leaving it there. Till and then government, which is saying, OK, where we're trusted is when we have a standard and where we do the testing. So that's an example of to your point, fitting up where we try to create the ecosystem. And it's frankly one of the projects at the White House I'm the most excited about, because it took a lot of work to launch. But now we can say, here's the ecosystem. Companies, please submit their products to be tested. If you're shopping, start asking for it, and let's see where it goes. Yeah, it, it's a super interesting example, because just like food labels or other things, you can always have a new standard, right? It's the Trustmark 1.1. It's the Trustmark 1.2. You can constantly improve it. It's not doesn't have to be a, a static point in time, right? It's the kind of the 2025 version. But it also is really embarrassing in that it points out, like, this is not a new idea, right? Trustmark type ideas. People, we've been wanting this for decades. People, I mean, I started my career in like 98 and we were talking about this in 99. So it's taken a long time. Why did the industry not do this themselves, right? This feels like the industry can handle it, but they couldn't. They didn't. They had decades to do it. So it felt like the government, right? Like the government doesn't want to get into the game, but sometimes it has to get into the game. Right? You know, it's, and to your point, it's also really cool because as you look around the room, there are so many people here from different backgrounds. And I have to say, the well, labeling idea really appealed to me because as you heard at the beginning, I keep kosher. Well, how do I know if something's kosher when I'm stopping in the store? There's a label and the label is tested against a particular kosher standard. So to be honest, we've seen that work, how that ecosystem works, and you copy it and do it here. But I want to come back to your point about cost and benefit, because right. we had this debate in another area of policy, which is paying ransoms. And the uh, question we often get is, you know, I mentioned $1.3 billion paid in ransoms. Why are ransomware attacks increasing? Well. They're profitable. Folks make a lot of money. So the question is, as governments, what should we do about that? Should we ban ransom payments as part of incentivizing, frankly, companies to say, why don't you put the money in at the beginning right. and improve cybersecurity? But then folks argue, what are you going to do when a hospital gets hit? And they say, well, if I pay this $5 million ransom, I can recover faster. So we've had this debate. Right. And where we came out, and ideas on this is we decided to take a pause, but really the, the construct we were talking about was saying, could you announce that you were considering putting in controls on ransoms? I am. So that would incentivize folks. I am to take all for blocking ransoms. I hate paying ransoms, and I, I would love if the government would mandate no paying ransoms. Just so you set a standard, and it's funny since I'm spending a lot of time in Singapore, they're so small, so they can do things very quickly, and so they're also. Um, can make decisions like can't pay ransom. Uh, and their view is like, America's too big, the ship sailed, they can never do it. You know, cat's out of the bag, can't do it. We have an option. It hasn't, it hasn't gotten that bad yet in Singapore. Maybe we can do it. Uh, we don't think they can do it. And, uh, and I tell them, it's like, hey, it's not all or nothing. You don't have to do the whole country or nothing. The federal government could just say, hey, the federal agencies can't pay a ransom. And you learn, oh, now these other critical industries don't can't pay ransom. And then they learn, right? You can do this in bite-sized chunks. You don't have to get sucked into, it doesn't work in my edge case. It's like, no, we can we, we do this in, in steps and learn. And if you know hospitals are going to be really hard, decide that later. Start with the easier cases, right? 
Um, so yeah, I, I just, I hope the conversation doesn't get sucked into an all or nothing. So that's the way you would approach it? Yeah. You just identify the ones you have most control over first that's the easiest to defend, easiest to explain, and then you work your way through it because you want to, I hate that we're giving money and fuel to our adversaries to get better. What I don't like is if you say, oh, hospitals, they can pay ransoms. Well, guess who's going to get hit? All the hospitals because they know that's their safe revenue source. You don't want to give them the roadmap. But the other thing that is fr it's frustrating is um, most ransoms, you know, can be sourced back mostly to Russia. And so it feels like at some level it's a nation-to-nation -nation problem. It's not me as a small business owner problem, right? Because if you can convince Russia to crack down on it, or that's probably 70% of the problem. And so, oh, if it's a 70% problem, my government needs to get involved in that, right? Because if it's really them trying to exercise power and influence us, us banning it, they're going to still try to influence us and do other things, you know? And so their objective hasn't changed. Maybe the way they approach it will. But anyway, sorry, I just have this big ransomware thing really bothers me. <laughs> because you watch ransomware groups hack into ransomware groups and leak it. They say they delete it. How do you verify they've deleted it? You don't know. Okay. There's this whole false sense that we paid them off and we're okay. It's, no, you're not okay. There's, once you empower the ransomware industry, and it is an industry, it's becoming a lobbying group. Well, I'm the insurance company that specializes in paying ransom. Oh, well, I'm the ransomware negotiator specialist group. Oh, I am the rating agency for which ransomware groups are credible. So when we pay, really, you're rating ransomware groups now. An ecosystem is built of special interests that want to perpetuate the ransomware payment industry, the Bitcoin bros, whatever. It's going to get metastasized and it's going to be here as an industry Interest. We're bringing Jeff in to help us work ransomware oh policy. Gosh. Sorry, I'm going to get more wine. Okay. <laughs> Sorry. Would you like some more? <laughs> okay. <laughs> Sorry, that's just a raw issue for me. Yes, thank you. Okay, so that was it. Sorry. <laughs> I'm curious on your reaction. You know, I think it's, it's very true that as we look at the ransomware problem, there's three ways we have to look at it. The first I mentioned earlier is the us way. We've seen, for example, that companies that just back up their data and keep them offline can recover faster than those who pay a ransom. So getting companies to back up, getting them to test, getting that in place. And frankly, in addition to that, we've launched some free programs at the White House for folks who we know have fewer resources, whether they're the nation's 1,800 rural hospitals. We now have a free program training them, getting them cybersecurity tech. Similarly for schools with less than 2,500 kids, because we recognize that for them, it's probably not a matter of will. It's probably a matter of skill and capability. So that's a big part of it. The second part of that is to say, what can we do to make it riskier, costlier, and harder? That's disrupting infrastructure around the world. Frankly, it's naming people who have conducted these attacks. You may have seen just recently the State Department named and put out a $10 million bounty for this was Iranian actors. I'm all for that. I'm all for the naming. Yeah. Who conducted attacks against water systems. And we see that folks don't like to be shouted out in that way. And then the final one is things we can do to take the fight to them. Those are things I can't talk about here. Um, but those are things we think through carefully as well. I'll know that we're bringing 70 countries together at the end of September, and countries from all over the world, from Vietnam to Ghana to Nicaragua, to everybody's affected by ransomware. And frankly, actors live around the world. Money moves all around the world through crypto infrastructure. So we bring countries together for things like classes on blockchain analysis, classes on regulatory approaches for them on how to secure their hospitals to help them and also to make it a global fight. So these are really exciting opportunities. We have a bunch of companies coming to also talk about what they'd like to do with other governments around the world in terms of disruptions and takedowns. So that's the way we approach it because it is a hard problem. And it's a hard problem when you have countries harboring people conducting attacks. And those are the government to government conversations we have to say, this isn't acceptable and here's what we want to do about it.
you know, and it's beyond just a criminal enterprise and it's actually coordinated at a government level, then it becomes a government, a much bigger government problem. And I, I just want to go back to your point about naming them. Um, when I, I uh, joined this Homeland Security Advisory Council years ago uh, when Janet Napolitano was the uh, uh, secretary, and I remember I was talking to some people and I said, how come we don't name our adversaries? Everybody knows China's coming after us. Everybody knows these things are going on. The industry, you know, we've known about it for years. But the government never names our adversaries. Why is that? And some of the people are like, oh, that's really interesting. I wonder, yeah, let's, well, not six months later, nine months later, not because of me, but six or nine months later, we named China. And once the government names somebody for an act, it actually gives permission to companies, oh, okay, it's just not my paranoid, crazy security guy. My government is saying it, right? It lends a certain amount of credibility. So by just naming them, even if you do nothing more than name them, companies can say, oh, well, we really don't want to maybe do business with them or we have to scrutinize employees hired from there or contracts or whatever. It gives permission for the companies and it gives the people in the risk groups something they can point to to say, this is why I'm asking you about our exports to Russia because they are involved in these kinds of activities. And so you might not even realize the benefit you're doing by giving permission for people in these companies to actually say those names out loud in a different context. And it doesn't cost you a whole new government program. That's why I'm, I'm a big fan of, of naming. You don't even have to necessarily shame them. You just kind of, you know. Yeah. So We know who you are and we yeah. can find out who you are, whether a person or a country. And we're telling all of our friends that you're no fun to play with. Right? Got to figure out how to adapt that part. Yeah, yeah. We're taking all of our marbles and going home. Not. Um, I've got this other interesting, I, I want to drop this on you now because I'm curious on your thoughts. Um, so maybe a year ago or so, Microsoft writes this report about um, Russia attacking their Azure infrastructure in their cloud. Ukraine has some assets in, in Azure. Microsoft writes this great report, releases some IOCs, talks about what they're seeing in their infrastructure. And um, in years, it brought to light, it illustrated this point that, first off, it reinforced the belief that if you're a cloud provider, you inherit the risk models of all of your customers. If Ukraine is a customer, their risk model is now your risk model. So these cloud providers have to be prepared to defend against every single client's risk model which is crazy, but it also means only the largest super hyperscalers can really perform at that level. The second is Russia's attacking Ukraine on Microsoft infrastructure, which might be in the United States, might be elsewhere. So that means you're battling, you're doing battle on Microsoft infrastructure. I'm going to keep repeating that because in air, sea, land, and space, you shoot down an airplane, the space is, sky is still there. You sink the ship, the ocean's still there, the blow up the tank, the earth is still the earth. But you fight in cyberspace and it will change and it will not be the same tomorrow. And you fight Microsoft on Microsoft territory, they'll just change it on you tomorrow. Right? So my instinct is you're probably not going to win against the guy, the company that controls your territory your domain. It's not your domain, it's their domain. You're just a guest and you're messing with them. Don't be surprised if all your stuff gets deleted tomorrow, right? That's super fascinating, but it leans me to believe there's no unconflicted parties now. Like Microsoft can't be neutral. It's sort of this great sorting. You're being sorted. You're being picked into sides. You're either pro-Microsoft or anti-Microsoft. If you're pro-Microsoft, that means you're probably anti-Russia because Russia is attacking Microsoft. Like, I didn't want to necessarily have to make that decision, but I'm being forced to make that decision, right? And these conflicts are sorting us, our tech stacks, our cloud providers. I mean, how do you think about territory or how do you think about it's no longer just a sales platform, right? It's, it's a domain. And, uh, and everybody is conflicted now. The, these are really the toughest questions now. 
because we have the laws of war are from physical wars, where people wear uniforms, or if not, they pretend to, or they dress in civilian clothes, and there are rules for that. And there's borders, right? There's the border of the war, and then there's folks in the homeland. And in digital war, those borders don't exist. The attribution is far harder, and the role of private companies is also different because we traditionally had a defense industrial base, right? The Northrop Grumman's of the world, the Lockheed Martin's of the world. For all intents and purposes, their sole or majority, vast majority customer was militaries, right? The U.S. militaries and, frankly, our allies' militaries. And now you see when the evening before you, Russia's invasion of Ukraine, they disable an American commercial satellite company. Why? Because one of its customers was the Ukrainian military, and they wanted to disrupt Ukrainian soldiers' ability to communicate. So that American company now, to the Russians, they were a combatant in the war. So those questions of what's the border? General Naksoni talked about the Chinese cyber attacks against infrastructure in the United States. We used to think that was the homeland. In prior wars, we have two oceans on either side of this country. It was really hard to cross that with submarines, planes. In digital space, vulnerabilities at home impact what can be done on the battlefield. You know, whenever folks tell me, and what offensive cyber options do we have for this? My question always is, okay, I'll tell you what they are, but let's talk about the next step. Our own digital infrastructure's vulnerabilities actually shape and limit what we can do offensively because we know we're very vulnerable. Think about the United States versus China on a great firewall. Think about the United States and our civil liberties and privacy, which we deeply, deeply value. But it means the U.S. government doesn't monitor U.S. network space. China has a massive firewall and monitors and defends Chinese IP space. So it's, it's an asymmetric battle in digital space. So those factors, where are the borders? Who is a combatant? And what are the roles of companies providing services to militaries? Another great example. You know, Taiwan is an island. In the event of a conflict, they have to think about cable cuts. The number of cable cuts has gone up significantly in the last year. A number of them could be just anchor drags, not malicious at all. As occurred after the Houthis struck a ship in the Red Sea, the ship was, was sailing unevenly and dragged an anchor along the bottom of the Red Sea and cut communications to several big parts of Africa for quite a period of time. That wasn't malicious, unless you consider the Houthi strike against maritime shipping a part of that, which is certainly malicious. But as Taiwan thinks about its resilience, which is probably satellite resilience to a cable cut and telecommunications, so that it's government, so that it's not isolated, it needs to think about, okay, which satellite, commercial satellite companies can we rely on in a conflict? And then which can be resistant to advanced electronic warfare and resistant to jamming. So there's a lot that now, in the context of technology moving much more quickly than traditional military weapons and rules of war that we have to think about, because there's a reason we want to have civilians and combatants. They lead to the points you made, Jeff, about a way to attribute, a way to hold people accountable if they're not following the laws of war. So these are the kinds of things which the conflict in Ukraine and more broadly, conflicts around the world are really showing us. I'll give another example. You know, one of the things we worked on in NATO was NATO had, often, had had a policy that said one or more cyber attacks could rise to the level of a kinetic attack, a physical attack, where NATO members will come behind an ally. Well, when Albania was cyber attacked by Iran and their entire government was disrupted, the question really was, what could NATO members quickly get there to help Albania recover? And we'd stood up a capability just where countries say, hey, I'll offer vulnerability analysis, I'll offer incident response, I'll offer attribution, so that as members we could come together and help a country in digital space. That kind of cooperation, how do allies actually work together, is also really new, and it also helps control conflict earlier, make it less likely that folks will escalate as they respond. So these are the kind of things we're thinking through. Okay, so I would love to keep talking to you for hours and go through that model, but we're out of time. So I'll give you any closing thoughts, your first time out at DEF CON, um, anything that you would, uh, any observations, anything you'd like to share? Um, 
Absolutely. Yeah. So first, feel really privileged to be here with everyone here. It looks like I'm so enjoying my time here. Folks often ask me, why are you in government? Government's slow. Government, I'm told, can be bureaucratic. <laughs> Who knows? And I often think to myself, my dad came here as a refugee, my grandparents came as refugees, and the fact that every day I can pretty much know that I have freedom to be me, what things I want to say, how I want to worship, who I want to talk with, is a tremendous privilege as we see looking around the world. And freedoms aren't free. We, defending that, working to ensure that we use the power, the skill, the talents that's represented in this room to ensure that folks around the world can rely on the medical service in their digitally connected hospitals, the power in their digitally connected power systems, and frankly, just being able to communicate around the world. Our digital systems are not resilient enough for everything that relies on them, and we can make it that way. When we think about, for example, so many things here, using the abilities you have, using the generative AI tools we see there to, when we find vulnerabilities, use them to patch them. There's so much ability here, and frankly, as tech continues to be a part of our lives, our economies, our militaries, our national security, really using the force for that good is a partnership I hope everybody here will think about. If anybody's interested in talking further, I'm available. Thank you for all you do every day, and looking forward to be back at DEF CON with another bottle of wine next year. <laughs>